Hello, my friends. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. Clinic Reviews does NCLEX reviews for nurses preparing to take their licensure exam. And today I am going to do six SATA questions. We're doing psych. We're focusing on psych. There's uh, not a ton of psych SATA questions, to be honest with you. Most of them are single choice, but I managed to find some and I thought I would do six. So our last SATA video is today and we're gonna do six questions. Let's get started. A client with bipolar disorder has been prescribed olanzapine, five milligrams two times a day, and lamotrigine, 25 milligrams two times a day. Which adverse effects should the nurse report to the healthcare provider? Immediately select all that apply. So what do I think when I first read this question? So first of all, I think, well, these are psych drugs, but I don't know what they are. But I do know they have bipolar disorder, so these are two psych drugs for bipolar disorder. So if I don't know the drugs exactly, I think, well, okay, they're drugs for bipolar. And then adverse effects to the nurse report. So you've got to understand that the word adverse effects is always a negative thing. Side effects, side effects are the most tested type of farm question on the NCLEX. So they test side effects more than anything else. And side effects are not things that we report to the healthcare provider. Side effects RNs are expected to teach about. Side effects RNs are expected to manage. Side effects RNs are expected to treat. So we are not looking for things that we would normally treat. We're looking for things that would cause us to call the doctor or would call, cause us to stop the medication. So adverse effects generally means, hey, you're calling the doctor. The reason you're calling the doc is because you're thinking we might have to stop the med. So what I always do when I get a question like this, and I don't know necessarily know the drugs, I say to myself, well, which things would I call the doctor for? And I have to think generally rather than specifically. So I have to think... Have I ever called the doctor about this before? So, rash. Do I expect to have, as a part of a drug side effect, have I ever taught a patient that they should expect to have a rash from a drug? That's the question I ask myself. You know what, let's read through, let's read through the answers first. Rash, nausea, sedation, hyperthermia, and muscle rigidity. Okay, so... The first thing I have to do when I'm thinking about answering adverse effects questions is, is this something I generally have called the doctor about? Because I don't necessarily know these drugs. I know they're psych drugs. I know they're for bipolar, but I don't necessarily know these drugs exactly. So I think to myself, have I ever called the doctor about this before? Because remember, if we're calling the doctor about it, we're thinking they're probably going to stop the drug. Is it bad enough that we would stop the drug? So let's look at this. Rash. Is that something I've ever called the doctor about? Well, when I see a rash, when a patient has a rash after they take a drug, do you know what I always think? Allergic. That's what I always think. So a rash to me is not a side effect. A rash is an adverse effect. I expect that means they're allergic to it. So I would definitely call the doctor about a rash. So I'm going to pick A. B, nausea. Okay. I've said this in another video, but I'll go ahead and say it here. GI side effects are the most common side effects of any drug. It almost doesn't even have to be PO. IV drugs have GI side effects. Like the most common side effect even of IV antibiotics is diarrhea. That's a GI side effect, right? So GI side effects are the most common side effects of just about any class of side effects. So nausea is GI. So I'm thinking that's got to be a side effect. I, I don't think that's that doesn't make sense to me to make it an adverse effect. So I don't think I'm going to pick nausea. C, sedation. All right, sedation. I don't like the word sedation, but I do know that psych drugs, almost all psych drugs, I'm trying to think if there's any, there are some like, uh, there are some that I'm not going to go into, but there are a couple psych drugs that don't have a side effect of sedation. But I know that the, the NCLEX tests on general principles the normal things, not the exceptions. They tend to, to test on the norm, not the exceptions. So I know that most psych drugs have a side effect of drowsiness, which is the same as sedation. So I'm thinking that if I gave my bipolar patient a drug and they became kind of drowsy and sleepy and maybe were start sleeping, I would think, well, that's not that unexpected. I, I mean, that's, that's okay. I'd expect that from a psych drug. So I'm not going to pick C. D, hyperthermia. Okay, hyperthermia is increased body temperature. 
again, when does the body temperature go up? Well, the body temperature goes up when you're having a response to something. It, uh, it could go up. You know why after someone um, starts getting a blood transfusion, do you know what we always have to do for the first half hour? We check their vital signs frequently for the first half hour, and we're watching to make sure their, their temperature doesn't go up. So hyperthermia to me says they're having an allergic reaction. Hyperthermia definitely is not something I would expect. So I definitely would call the doctor if the body temperature went up as soon as I gave them the drug. All right, E, muscle rigidity. Well, muscle rigidity, I mean, I, I don't, I'm trying to think if I've ever taught a patient that muscle rigidity is something they should expect to have happen after they start taking a new med. I can't, I can't think of it as a general rule. I mean, I te teach people headache. I teach people nausea. I teach people sedation. I even teach people difficulty sleeping, but I don't teach people muscle rigidity. So um, that doesn't sound like a side effect to me. It sounds more like an adverse effect. So based on general knowledge, not specific knowledge about these specific drugs, but general knowledge about psych drugs, I'm going to pick A, D, and E, and those are the right answers. Next question. A new client on the psych unit has been diagnosed with depression and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. During visiting hours, her husband states to the nurse that he does not understand this diagnosis and what can be done about it. What information should the nurse share with the client and her husband? Select all that apply. All right, so first of all, the questions you get on NCLEX are not going to be this long. But nevertheless, let's talk about it. Because the thing that I want to point out in this question is that there's two problems in the question. And I've talked to you about this before. If you haven't watched the last two SATA videos, you can go back and watch them. But this is something I've talked about before. When there's two problems in the question, you have to address both of them in the answers. And when you have a SATA question, you have to say to yourself, does this option, this answer, address one or both of the problems? Okay, so if it addresses one, you go, well, I can still pick it. If it addresses both, I say, well, I can still pick it. When you can't pick it as if it addresses one, but is contraindicated with the other one. Contraindicated with the other one. So I can't say, well, I'm going to do this for depression, even though it's contraindicated in obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Do you see what I'm saying? So it has to be okay. It has to be good for one and at least not negative for the other one. Or it could address both. Okay, so I have two things and I'm looking for... Let me see here. What information should the nurse share with the client and her husband? So he's saying, I don't understand the diagnosis, depression, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, and what can be done about it. So I'm looking for statements that talk about how to understand and what to do about it. Both of those things. So this is a pretty complicated question, to be honest with you. You have a lot of things to keep track of. Two problems and two things we're teaching. So we're looking for true statements about what are these diagnoses and what do we do about it? All right. Perfectionism and overemphasis on, ta on tasks usually interferes with friendship and leisure time. B, it will help to interrupt her tasks and tell her you are going out for the evening. C, there are medicines such as clomipramine or fluoxetine that may help. D, remind your wife it is okay to be human and make mistakes. E, reinforce with her that she is not allowed to expect the whole family to be perfect too. F, this order typically involves inflexibility and a need to be in control. Okay, so these all sound like reasonable statements to me. So now I'm going to go through, like, none of them are, are giving me a red flag. I go, what? I've never heard of this before, right? So I'm going to go through them, and I'm going to say, is it true for one or both? And does it talk about understanding the diagnosis and what can be done about it? Perfectionism and overemphasis on tasks usually interferes with friendship and leisure time. Well, that sounds like obsessive personality, compul obsessive compulsive personality disorder to me, perfectionism and overemphasis on tasks. So, so that's helping them understand the diagnosis. So I like A. B, it will help to interrupt her tasks and tell her you are going out for the evening. Okay, so it's saying you, what, you can do about, what you can do about obsessive personality disorder and depression is you can interrupt her tasks and tell her you're going out for the evening. Well, that does not sound therapeutic at all for either depression or obsessive compulsive personality disorder. In fact, sort of sounds like a bad thing, especially for obsessive compulsive personality disorder. I don't like that at all. So I'm thinking no to B. C, there are medicines such as clomipramine or fluoxetine that may help. Okay, clomipramine and fluoxetine are antidepressants. I don't remember the class. 
but I know they're antidepressants, so they are certainly can be used uh, for the depression. So what can be done about it? So we can give medicines for the depression, like clomipramine and fluoxetine, and they're not contraindicated in obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So C looks like a good option to me. D, remind your wife it is okay to be human and make mistakes. All right, what can we do about it? Reminding your wife, so if it's true that perfectionism and overemphasis on tasks interferes with friendship and leisure time, would it be then okay to remind your wife it's, it's okay to be human and make mistakes? I mean, that sounds like a good idea to me. It sounds reasonable, and it's not contraindicated. So when I'm doing SATA questions, a lot of times what I say to myself is, does it sound like a good idea? And is it contraindicated? Because I don't want to throw my common sense out the window, especially with SATA questions. SATA questions require you not throw your common sense out the window. And so reminding your wife it's okay to be human and make mistakes. Nobody's taught me that. Nobody taught me that in a lecture. There's no list somewhere that I should have memorized that. It just makes sense. And it's not contraindicated. So I'm going to pick it. E, reinforce with her that she is not allowed to expect the whole family to be perfect too. So I don't like the words not allowed. This is a psych question. And to say not allowed is just does not sound therapeutic to me at all. Um, and so that just does not sound good. So I'm not picking E. This is disorder typically involves inflexibility and the need to be in control. Well, that sounds true for obsessive compulsive personality disorder. It's not true for depression, but it's certainly not contraindicated in depression or there's nothing about it that's wrong about depression. So um, that does describe obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So I like A, perfectionism and overemphasis on tasks usually interferes with friendship and leisure time. That's obsessive compulsive. B, I don't like because it's not therapeutic. C, I like because it's used to treat depression. D, remind your wife it is okay to be human and make mistakes. Just makes sense. So I'm going to pick that. E, reinforce with her she's not allowed to do something. No, I don't like that. F, this order typically involves inflexibility and the need to be in control. That's true about obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So the correct answers are A, C, D, and F. A client has been diagnosed with dementia related to chronic and heavy alcohol consumption. In a family meeting with the client, discharge plans are being discussed. Which points should the nurse share with the family and client? Select all that apply. All right, so once again, we have two problems in the question. We have dementia and alcohol use. Okay, dementia and alcohol use. Now, one of the things we teach in the clinic reviews is about the dementia that results from heavy alcohol use. So I'm not going to give away everything we teach in the clinic reviews, but there is a type of dementia that comes from prolonged alcohol use. And if you stop drinking, you can prevent the dementia from getting worse, but you can't reverse dementia. Dementia can never be reversed. Dementia is chronic. Delirium is acute. Dementia is chronic and not reversible. Delirium is acute and is reversible. Okay, so I find that people who don't do well on NCLEX don't know the difference between dementia and delirium. And you got to know the difference between those two. Again, I'll say it again. Dementia is chronic and not reversible. Delirium is acute and is reversible. All right, so let's look at this. We have alcoholism and we have dementia. So those are the two things we need to take into consideration. So what are we going to share with the family and the client? Let's read the answers. Even after all alcohol has been removed from the home, clients frequently find ways to get more. B, without continued alcohol intake, the client will gradually get better. C, with the memory loss, answer the client's questions once and then ignore the question when asked again. D, safety alarms on the doors will help to keep the client from wandering off. And E, as the need for supervision increases, it may be necessary for the client to be placed in an extended care facility. Okay, so all those things um, seem reasonable to me. None of them are jumping out at me with major red flags, like I've never heard of them before. So let's go through, and we're gonna we're gonna pick them if it's true for one of the problems or both of the problems, and not contraindicated in the other. Okay, even after all alcohol has been removed from the home, clients frequently find ways to get more. That is true for alcoholism. So since it's true for alcoholism, and it's not wrong. I mean, it's not like contraindicated to say that with dementia, it's, it's true for alcoholism, um, I, I, I can pick it. B, without continued alcohol intake, the client will gradually get better. Okay, so this is what I meant by not being contraindicated for the other one. 
It's true that if alcoholics stop drinking, they'll start to get better. That's true. But it's not true for dementia. So even if you stop drinking, the dementia does not get does not improve. So this is true for alcoholism, but it's not true. It's absolutely not true. It's like the opposite. It's a false for the dementia. So I cannot pick it. Okay. C, with the memory loss, answer the client's questions once and then ignore that question when asked again. All right. That's not therapeutic. This is a psych question. I want to be therapeutic and that's not therapeutic. So I'm not picking it. D, safety alarms on the doors will help to keep the client from wandering off. Well, that's true for dementia. Not necessarily something I consider for alcoholism, but it's not like, it's not like the other one where it was false for alcoholism, right? So it's true for, for dementia, so I can pick it. As the, as the need for supervision increases, it may be necessary for the client to be placed in an extended care facility. Well, that's true for dementia. Not necessarily true for alcoholism, but it's not false for alcoholism, like, like the other one was, so I can still pick it. So the ones that are true for one or both and not false for one are A, D and E, A, D and E. Next question, which intervention should the nurse include in the plan of care to prepare a client for electroconvulsive therapy? Select all that apply. All right, electroconvulsive therapy is something that's done. I don't know a lot about it, to be honest with you. It's something done with psych. I think it's typically done when people have really severe depression, and I don't know exactly how it all works, but... Um, it's not like it used to be done the way it used to be done. I mean, they they sedate people now. It's not like cruel and unusual. But I do know that when they put the electrodes on the head, I think, I think, anyway, they do this and the person is going to be groggy and have some memory lapses afterwards, at least for a little while. So the one thing I do know about electroconvulsive therapy is they can't drive home. All right, so that's the one thing I know about ECD. So let's read this question again. Which intervention should the nurse include in the plan of care to prepare a client for ECD? So this isn't talking about afterwards. See, I know something about afterwards, but I, this is about preparing them. So I didn't talk about that. So I'm going to read through the answers and see what we've got. A, maintain NPO status. B, verify if the consent is signed. C, orient the client to place and time. D, remove dentures. E, request the client to void and F, assess client vital signs every 30 minutes. So it's important to remember that we're preparing the client because some of these look to me like things I would do afterwards, not before. So in preparing, let's, let's do true-false. In preparing the client for ECT, we would maintain NPO status. That seems true to me. Um, it's a, you're like shocking this patient. So yeah, I don't really want them regurgitating or throwing up in the middle of it. So yeah, we're going to maintain NPO status. That sounds good. In preparing a client for ECT, we're going to verify if the consent is signed. Absolutely, we're going to do that. In preparing a client for ECT, we're going to orient the client to place and time. I don't see any reason to have to do that before. There's no reason to think they're confused before. Now, afterwards, yes, because they're groggy, they have some memory lapses, but not, not before. So no. In preparing a client for ECT, I'm going to remove their dentures. Well, yes, definitely. Don't want them biting themselves during the procedure or hurting themselves, so yes. In preparing a client for ECT therapy, I'm going to request they void. Yes, yeah, absolutely. We don't want them to inadvertently become incontinent during the procedure. That just seems like a good thing to do in preparing people for just about everything. So I'm going to do that. In preparing a client for electroconvulsive therapy, I'm going to assess the client vital signs every 30 minutes. That sounds like something I would do after the procedure, not before. So there's two here that I would do after, but the rest I would do before. So I would do A, B, D, and E before the procedure. Okay, next question. A client has been transferred to the hospital's psych unit from a nursing home for increasing confusion. The client's behavior is found to be the result of cerebral arteriosclerosis. Which nursing staff actions should positively influence the client's behavior? Okay, a client has been transferred to the hospital's psych unit from a nursing home Oh, they're coming from a nursing home, going to the psych unit for increasing confusion. The client's behavior is found to be a result of cerebral arterial sclerosis, which nursing staff action should positively influence the client's behavior. So they don't tell me if it's delirium or dementia. 
They only tell me they're confused and it's from this, physio it's this physiological reason for it. So I'm just going to have, since they don't tell me if it's delirium or dementia, it sounds to me closer to a dementia since it's a physiological cause. Nevertheless, it's increasing confusion. So I'm going to have to deal with confusion. So I'm, I don't have like a list in my head of how to deal with confusion. So I've got to really put my common sense hat on right now and see what makes sense. Okay, nursing staff should positively influence the client's behavior. So they're, they're confused. So what does positively influence mean? Well, if they're confused, they can get very agitated and frustrated over being confused. So I don't want them to get agitated and frustrated, right? So that's what I'm kind of trying to prevent. All right. Let's see. Limit the client's choices. B, accept the client as he is. C, allow the client to do as he wishes. D, act nonchalantly. E, explain to the client what he needs to do step by step. All right, they're confused. All right, positively influencing behavior would include limiting the client's choices. Well, they're confused. I would think, common sense wise, I would think that it would be more confusing if I had to choose between five things I wanted to eat for dinner. So if they said, do you want lasagna or do you want chicken or do you want a BLT or do you want a salad? Or if they just said, do you want chicken or lasagna? See, that would be easier just to choose between chicken and lasagna if I'm confused. Because by the t if I'm confused by the time you get to the fourth or fifth selection, I forget what you said the first time. So it seems to me that limiting the client's choices, just common sense, just makes sense. So I'm going to pick that. Accepting the client as he is would positively influence a confused client's behavior. I mean, I don't see why not. It seems like a good idea. It's certainly not contraindicated. Makes sense. Therapeutic. It seems therapeutic. Don't we all accept people as they are? Like that seems like something we're all supposed to do. So um, I'm going to pick B. I like that. Allowing the client to do as he wishes would positively influence a confused client's behavior. Well, I don't see that. If he's confused and he starts pulling out his IV and cussing at the nurses, like I don't see how that would positively influence his behavior. I just, that just doesn't make sense to me. So I, I can think about it, but I don't think that sounds good. Acting nonchalantly would positively influence a confused client's behavior. Acting nonchalantly. So like you don't care, like, eh, whatever. Eh, sure. Oh, you just pulled your IV out? Uh, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I don't know. That just doesn't seem like a good thing to do. Generally speaking, just a I've never read anywhere that acting nonchalantly is a therapeutic communication tool, <laughs> behavioral tool. Like, I've never read that. So I don't think I'm going to pick it. Explaining to the client what he needs to do step by step could positively influence a confused client's behavior. That definitely makes sense to me. Uh, d explaining step by step because they're going to forget multi step tasks, right? So, if I can explain it step by step, it seems like that would be helpful. So, I know I'm going to do A, B, and E. C, allowing the client to do as he wishes. I still don't like it. D, acting nonchalantly. I still don't like that one at all. So, I'm just going to pick A, B, and E. And those are the right answers. We're on our last one already. Okay, again, this is a long question. NCLEX wouldn't be this long, but let's still let's see if we can learn something from the, the concept here. A client has been in the critical care unit for three days following a severe MI. Although he is medically stable, he has begun to have fluctuating episodes of consciousness, illogical thinking, and anxiety. He is picking at the air to catch those baby angels flying around his head. While waiting for medical and psychiatric consults, which needs have the highest priority? Select all that apply. So I hope you recognize this as delirium. This is not dementia. Dementia is a chronic confusion that gets worse over time and does not get better. This person, it looks as though he was completely alert and oriented before he came into the hospital. It doesn't tell us otherwise. 
It's because, it, and it says he has begun to have fluctuating episodes. It doesn't say he continues to have them. It says he's begun to have these things, and he's picking at the air to catch baby angels flying around his head. So this is a acute onset of confusion, and I know acute onset of confusion is delirium. And one thing I know about delirium is that people will hallucinate. They have delusions. They believe things that aren't true. They see things that aren't there, hear things that aren't there. And generally speaking, I need to keep them safe until they get better, basically. So delirium is acute. It will get better. I don't know if he's delirious because he's in the ICU and he has so much stimulation and he's in a new place. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know why he's delirious, but I know that I need to try to keep him as calm as I can, that I need to keep him safe. Um, so these are just things that are in my head as I'm thinking through this before I even look at the answers. So let's read through the answers. Decreasing as much of normal stimuli as possible, A. B, avoiding challenging the client's perceptions about baby angels. C, orienting the client about his medical condition. D, gently presenting reality as needed. E, calling the client's family to report his onset of dementia. Okay, so let's, uh, we know it's delirium, first of all. So I, I don't like E, I, like I read it. I hate to just cross something off immediately. I'll read it again to make sure, but I really don't think E is, is going to be something I'm going to pick because um, we're looking what needs have the highest priority. All right, A, decreasing as much of normal stimuli as possible. That just seems like a good idea to me. Just, I mean, across the board, it almost doesn't matter what the problem is. I think I would pick A. It's just a good end clicks answer. I like it. B, avoiding challenging the client's perceptions about baby angels. So delirium, you cannot um, convince them that what they're seeing, hearing, or tasting, or believe, you can't convince them it's not true. They are acutely delirious. And there's no convincing them that what they see, hear, taste, whatever, isn't true. So I really don't want to challenge the client's perceptions about baby angels at all. So, and it's not what it's picking at the air, fine. He can pick at the air, no problem. So I'm not, I'm not, I am going to avoid challenging the client's perception. So I'm going to pick C. B, I'm going to pick B. C, orienting the client about his medical condition. This is not the time during an acute delirium. This is not the time to orient him about his medical condition. He is not capable of learning about his medical condition right now. A delirium is an acute change in mental status. It involves confusion, hallucinating, delirium, uh, I'm sorry, delusions, um, and so forth. So this is not the time to start teaching him about his medical condition. So I'm not going to do C. D, gently present reality as needed. So this one threw me off a little bit because generally speaking, I don't present reality to people with delirium. Like I don't come in and say, you know, you're not really, there's really no angels there. You're really in the hospital. You had a myocardial infarction. Did you know that? Like that's not my main goal for someone with an acute delirium. However, the wording of this answer has convinced me to pick it. And here's the wording. Gently present reality as needed. It doesn't say reorient him to person, place, and time. If it said reorient him to person, place, and time, I would not pick it. But this is a very, very light touch on this. Very light, gently, as needed. See, that those are very good and complex words. And... Sure, why wouldn't I gently present reality as needed? I mean, if it's needed, I got to do it, right? So D is, I'm okay with D. E, calling the client's family to report his onset of dementia. This is not dementia, it is delirium. Dementia is chronic. He would have come in already confused or having some memory issues or speech issues upon admission. It would not have happened acutely only after his MI. So it's not dementia. So the correct answers are A, B, and D. This is our last SATA video. Next month, we're getting started on something new. I'm excited to start the new month with you, and I hope you have a great rest of your weekend.